Hello everybody! This feels so strange. For the last five or six years, whenever I sit down to film on Sunday mornings, it has been for weekly wrap-ups. <laughs> And today I'm not going to be talking about books or reading at all. I'm going to be talking about what I have made. In fact, because I'm terrible at names, this monthly series will probably be called What I Made. <laughs> Um, basically, I have just really, really gotten into like fiber artists and stuff over the past two years to an extent that it is a large part of my life and I want to talk about it more regularly. So I will be doing monthly videos about crocheting, knitting, sewing, and also uh, botanical or natural dyeing because that's, that's also something I have developed an interest in. So. Here goes! Um, this is the first one for 2021 and I'm going to be talking about stuff that I have uh, made and have been doing in January and February. So I have a bunch of things to show you that I have completed, works in progress, I'll be talking about natural dyeing stuff at the end, and I'll probably also talk about what I plan on starting next because I am a planner. <laughs> I see something that I want to make and then I plan exactly what materials I'm going to get and when I'm going to start making it and I schedule everything because that, that's the way that I am. So um, if you use Ravelry, I do too. I am Kalanadi on Ravelry as well and I will be leaving links to a lot of like patterns and projects and stuff down in the description if that is useful to you. I pretty religiously update my Ravelry projects and take lots of notes and stuff so yeah. It's all there if you care to go find it. And with that, let's get into it. Let's start with finished objects. I have finished a couple of garments and a couple of smaller things so far this year. We'll start with the small things because there's not that much to say about them. So first of all, I have made a pair of Nello House socks. This is a pattern by Tiff Nealon. I've been eyeing a lot of her patterns and finally broke down and bought a couple of them and I've been making them. So the Nello House socks, um, they're kind of like DK weight socks. You you make them with two, two strands of fingering weight or sock yarn held together and that's what I did with these. I just had leftover yarn that I whatever so I held it double for this. I think this is like a Samnus Garn fingering weight yarn and then some Scipius Our Tribe whatever. Um, it's a bit difficult to see the actual pattern. I don't have like sock blockers or anything here. Uh, let's see if you can actually see any of that pattern. Oh there we go. There we go. Um, this is just a fun thing to do. Uh, it was my first time doing the herringbone stitch for the cuff. Um, I did not do it particularly well, <laughs> let's say that. Um, but they were really fun to do and the kind of lace chart on it was just addictive. So yes, they are warm and they fit. They're good bumming around the house socks. I plan on making another pair of these, but I want to make them with more of the lace part of the chart rather than the pearl rose. Um, so I'll probably do different repeats of the chart and I want it to have a longer leg. I got these done. I did them exactly per the pattern instructions and I felt like they were too short. I really like long socks, like knee-high length socks. So um, I'll probably do another scrappy version of this in the future. Um, it's just really great for those bits and bobs of sock yarn that you have left over because you hold things double. You can do lots of blending and fading and gradients and stuff. So yeah, um, I'm very happy with these. And then um, this is such a, a weird looking thing when it's not actually on my dog, but I made a dog sweater. <laughs> this is the Lucky Dog Sweater pattern by Pearl Soho. It is a paid for pattern. I'm not entirely sure that I'm pleased I spent like nine dollars on it or whatever, but it does work. Um, I just knit this on a whim with some worsted weight yarn that I had left over. I did a very weird stripey blending thing because I didn't have enough of the like teal green color for it. And so yeah, I just wanted to try making my dog a sweater and this actually fit. I thought it was gonna not work at all. I didn't do a gauge swatch. I just jumped into making it and I made some modifications when I realized that my row gauge was really different. But it does fit. 
it's a little bit short in the neck I should have done a little bit more ribbing and the body is a bit too loose I thought actually that the chest portion wasn't wide enough but there was actually just too much loose fabric like on my dog's back so it fits I can get it on her she will tolerate it but it um, it slides around too much and then she can start to like get her legs out of out of the little armholes So it's cute and I'll probably make another one that fits better in the future But I don't have any like uh, worsted weight scraps at the moment. So We'll see I should probably just like go get some acrylic yarn and play around with it because that would be good Like I can wash acrylic and my dog gets very dirty. So there you go. I made a little dog sweater. It's sort of a success. <laughs> Everything else I've made this year have been garments and I'm going to build up to probably one of the best things I've ever made but we're going to go with the other two things first. One of them is what I am currently wearing. If I can stand up and actually show this to you, will it actually focus on my chest? <laughs> there we go. The lighting is not the best. You can really see that pattern now. So this is the Chloe sweater. Um, it's a pattern by Aliona Shea, who is, I think, a Russian designer. It is a paid-for pattern, and um, you have this really great, like, ribbing effect that really makes it stretchy um, horizontally from side to side. Um, if you are a crocheter and a knitter, you understand the difference there. Knitting naturally stretches side to side a lot, but not very much um, vertically, and crochet is the opposite. It stretches a lot vertically, but not very much side to side. So this pattern has you work front and back panels from side to side so you get that stretchy ribbing effect across the width of the body. It's really fantastic. I love that idea and the the chart for the front, this design with like these sort of almost like braided twisted motifs is really cool. So I had a lot of fun making this. Um, I modified it because I didn't do a gauge swatch. Um, this yarn is a Barocco yarn ultra wool fine I think I bought it and I knit it up into a boxy sweater last year it was a tent I couldn't wear it so I ripped it out I washed the yarn I reskeined it and then I used it for this project and I thought I wouldn't need to block it again I was so wrong I put this on this morning and was like what is up with this bulging so I will need to like fully wet block this in a little bit um, so what else do I want to say about it Mainly, it's really cool. I found it pretty easy to modify on the fly when I realized that my gauge was going to make it too small. I just inserted um, repeats in, um, like, the pattern has you work a shoulder and then the body and then the other shoulder, and I just put in some rows in each of those and then duplicated that number of rows on the back panel, which is plain. So this pattern is, it's really gorgeous design. However, the English translation is pretty much a garbled mess. Um, there are some parts of it that are literally just gibberish as far as I can tell. Um, there are videos, however, and even though they're in Russian, um, that it helps you understand the actual stitches that you're making, so that was really helpful. So I, I enjoyed making this, but I don't think the pattern is a good one to start with if you have never done garments before. Um, I would totally recommend it for like intermediate level crocheters who have already um, done different garment construction methods before. If you understand uh, basic garment construction that's worked flat and then seamed, the pattern makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Oh, I also made um, shorter sleeves. I was running low on yarn, so I did three-quarter length sleeves that came out the perfect length, and I just made up my own method. I just worked it until I had a tube that fit my arm and fit the armhole that I had left unseamed. So there's, there's that. I really love the way that it turned out. It fits quite well, and it will look better once I have blocked it. <laughs> Next up is the other Tiff Nealon pattern that I have done. I did a rendition of her Coastal Crop Raglan. Um, this was not a planned project. I had three skeins of this really, really beautiful, rich purple tweed color. Um, this is Olan Donegal DK um, in the color 
tough love, I think. It was an impulse purchase because I loved the color and I was really intent on getting some sort of tweedy yarn at the time. I think I bought this back in August. Um, and I realized that I had just barely enough to make this pattern. And so I bought the pattern in Castadon and just went for it. I'm turning into that person who never swatches properly. That is because my gauge depends far more on the size of what I'm knitting than on like actual needle size or anything. Um, anyway, <laughs> that, that's a conversation for some other day. Um, for some reason the back of this collar keeps flipping down and I, it's been blocked, I swear. So um, yeah, it's a very cropped raglan style sweater. So you work those raglan decreases for the yoke and then you split for the sleeves. Um, it's very, very short in the body. I wish that I could have added more length because I'm, I don't wear a lot of really cropped things, but I did not have enough yarn. In retrospect, I wish that I had made short sleeves and used some of that yarn to make the body longer because I put it on and was like, it's a little bit short. Um, my favorite detail is that there is this like faux braid up the side. Let me see if I can actually show this to you properly. Maybe that's showing up a little bit now. It's a really cool detail and it is dead simple to knit. It is like this two row repeat. I was so surprised at how simple and fun it was to do. So this just flew off the needles. Not a planned project, but a really fun one to do. I should probably like actually put it on and see how it fits now that it's been blocked. <laughs> Hang on one second. Okay, now that it's on, I think you can see it a little bit better. So I got that detail underneath the arms. There's a little bit of lace at the raglan increases. So my favorite thing about the sweater actually is now that I have it on, the sleeves are quite tight and the cuffs are quite tight fitting. Um, this is twisted rib, which I really enjoyed knitting and just used some um, leftover sock yarn. I think this is like sock obsession yarn that I used for a project last year. So yeah, I like that. I really like the sleeves on this. I guess I'm just gonna wear this for the rest of this video now. <laughs> it's not too warm, so hey, I quite like it. I should have tried it on before I started filming this. Okay, so that is the Coastal Crop Raglan sweater. I will definitely do more of Tiff Neeland's patterns in the future. Um, I feel like a lot of her stuff looks kind of like this. Um, I really love how she plays with color, especially with like marling and holding two strands of yarn together. So I will be looking into uh, future patterns of hers to make some more things. But now, it is time for my pride and joy. This is the first thing I think I finished this year. Um, I started it in December while I was on my like holiday <laughs> time vacation and I finished it early in January. And that is, which way is the front? Which way is the back? Here we go. Um, this thing. Oh my God, it is so light and squishy. <laughs> this is my broadleaf sweater. It is all over brioche. It's so cool. I love brioche. This pattern is by Wool and Pine and I fell in love with it when I saw the preview pictures on Instagram. I actually pre-ordered the pattern. <laughs> And I, I swatched for it and everything. Um, I was looking for a project that would have slightly more advanced brioche than I had done before, but wouldn't be like overly complicated. And this, this arrived at just the right time. So um, it is a, a seamed sweater. You work the back and front panels separately, then you seam them up the sides, and then you do the sleeves. Um, uh, the only modification I made to this is that I did a three needle bind off for the shoulders. Um, so instead of just binding off my panels when I was done with them, I retained stitches for the shoulders and I just bound off the neckline. Um, 
this was not difficult to do. It was actually pretty much the same size as my Weekender light sweater, which is a pattern by Andrea Mowry. I love that sweater and I kind of just put this on top of it and kind of like figured out roughly how many stitches um, to withhold for the, the shoulders and stuff. So yes, I love it. I knit it obsessively. I really, really enjoy doing brioche stitches and it's just, it's magical when that design starts to come through. So I'm not sure that my color choices are the best for brioche here. In person, you can really see the design more, but I keep, I keep like choosing darker colors to go on a lighter background and brioche really pops more when you have the lighter color on top. This design can also be seamed inside out, and a lot of people seem to do that. I'll turn it inside out and show you what it looks like on the other side, um, which is a really cool idea, but uh, I wanted the more golden color on the outside. So this is what the reverse side looks like, and honestly, that pops a little bit more. You can really see more of the, the brioche pattern from that side, but anyway. I love this thing so much. Um, yeah, I, in fact, I've been a little bit nervous about wearing it because I'm like, what if I ruin it or something? But yeah, I need, I need to wear this more before it gets super warm and I put it away. That is it. That is my broadleaf sweater. I'm actually considering doing another version of this. Um, I made this with a stash yarn. The Golden yellow color is a color called turmeric from Yarn Experiments, and I bought just randomly two skeins of that over the summer. And then the main color for like the sleeves is a speckled cream color called Drops of Jupiter from uh, Treehouse Knits. I love Treehouse Knits. Her colors are so gorgeous. And then the mohair, because like, you hold the like background color um, a double with a strand of mohair, and that's just a plain white mohair silk lace yarn that came from my father's deep stash. He bought it like 20 years ago for some sort of like shawl pattern. He made a scarf out of it, I think, and then decided he didn't like knitting with it. So he had four untouched balls of this mohair silk lace and was like, do you want it? And I was like, yes. <laughs> But when I was still trying to decide what color I wanted to make it in, I bought yarn from Knit Picks to do a gray and red version. And now I'm just sort of holding it back. I'm like, do I want to make a second version or do I want to wait and see if Wool and Pine does another brioche pattern that might use similar um, yarn types or something? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I really should not impulse purchase so much yarn just because it's pretty. Okay, I have one more finished object to show you, which is going to be very, very brief. But basically, I finally busted out my sewing machine for the first time in five months. Long story short, I made a pair of Aronite pants last year, and it was a grueling experience. It almost broke me. My mother had to save my project when I almost destroyed it. And then I put away my sewing machine and didn't look at it for five months. And then I felt sufficiently recovered that I actually sewed together the pieces of this black camisole that I had cut out like six months ago. <laughs> this is a dune cami. It's a really simple camisole pattern. I don't particularly love it. I think it's because I'm really used to um, tightly fitting camisoles that are made with knit fabric, so they're really stretchy, and this has no stretch. It's just made out of a light cotton fabric, and it's not, it's not like on the bias or anything. So I sewed it together, and it didn't break me, and we're gonna move on now. <laughs> Well, that was an unexpected interlude. Um, yeah, it's some time later. My dog has been injured in some way and I need to finish this up and then go get her some safe pain medication. So if I am not quite as excited right now, it's because I've got that on my mind. Um, also, if you hear weird noises, there are a bunch of people 
moving into the house across the street from me now. So there's been a lot of yelling and banging and stuff. But anyway, where, where was I before? I think I was getting onto works in progress. So I will show this to you relatively quickly. Uh, first up is a small project that I started back in December and it's a shame I haven't finished it yet. And that is I'm making a pair of gloves. Um, so I actually have one glove done. It does not fit perfectly for reasons I will explain in a second, but um, it's a glove. I really, really need gloves. It took me about two days to knit it, and um, it wasn't as finicky as I thought. I'm also magic looping the fingers, like the whole thing I'm magic looping it, and it's a lot less fiddly than trying to use DPNs for the little tiny amounts of stitches. So I did the first glove back at the end of December, and I was like, yay, another couple more days and I'll have a finished pair of gloves to wear. Two months later, this is as far as I've gotten on the second glove. Um, so I have split off the, the thumb and I have, uh, I'm, I'm at the point now where I need to start working the fingers. So that is the slightly slower part. Um, so I should get this finished. The reason it doesn't fit very well is that let me put this back on again. Um, I first I thought that I had worked the um, thumb gusset too long. There's a, a lot of space right here. I've got this big web between the thumb and the palm of my hand. And I thought it was just the gusset was too long for the, the length basically of my hand. But it turns out instead that it's that the, the palm of my hand is longer so I needed to work more stitches before I started working the rest of the fingers to kind of bring it down because if I really like scrunch it down it cuts into my other fingers um, but it's better on the thumb so I plan on making a second pair of this with uh, leftover yarn and stuff and doing it better but I have to make the second one to match the first and, and they they are wearable they just don't fit perfectly so this is a free pattern. It's the Gem Gloves from Pearl Soho. Um, you can find it on Ravelry and you just use the page on their website for it. So it is very straightforward and um, I think it's pretty easy to figure out how to do it and how to like customize it. So this should be done by my next update on projects. Next, I have two tops that I'm working on. You can probably tell I just make lots of garments. I like making big projects. I'm not into a lot of accessories. Um, so this next project is the Orime Pullover by Veronica Avery. It's a pattern for Brooklyn Tweed. I'm not entirely sure how to say the name of this pattern. I believe it's a Japanese word. So Orime or something like that. Um, so to explain this, I basically fell in love with this yarn which is Brooklyn Tweed Peary in the color Ginger Snap. I just, I love this kind of golden brown color. It's so beautiful. Um, and I was looking up projects on Ravelry that used this specific color and I found a version of the Orime pattern in this and I thought it was so lovely looking. So I bought the pattern, I bought the yarn and back around like April or May of last year, I started working on it. I knit like, eight, nine inches, and then realized that my gauge, my tension problems were just ruining it. So I went through this phase where I was knitting so loosely, I couldn't like get down to a good sock gauge. And this is, this is knit pretty much at like 27 stitches per four inches or something like that. So even though I was swatching and I was using teeny tiny needles, I just couldn't get gauge. And then I'm a continental knitter, so I hold, um, I'm right-handed and I hold my working yarn in my left hand. And I knit very loosely. I don't tension my yarn that much, but because of the way that I hold the yarn when I purl, my purling is quite tight. And this produces a problem called rowing out. It's not super visible on like a, a stockinette side, just the plain knit fabric. But um, if you turn it over to the reverse stockinette side, rowing out is a lot more visible. You get these gaps in between the purl bumps of the rows. 
And with this project, the reverse stockinette side is the, the right side of the garment. So I was having terrible issues getting gauge. It was affecting the shaping of the garment. And then my rowing out problem made the fabric look really messy when it was like stretched and blocked. So I was very frustrated. I ripped the entire thing out. I still have like the skein of yarn that I, I ripped out and um, washed and everything. And then I just did other projects for a while. And then at the beginning of this year, I felt confident that I had, that I understood my gauge problems a lot better. So I, I started working on it again and I have made one half of it. This is the back panel. It's curling a lot. It's not blocked or anything. Um, so if I hold it up here, you can probably see the, the pattern on it. It's very subtle. And it's basically um, knit stitches on the reverse stockinette side that produces the the lines on this. I think the whole the the collection that this pattern comes from is inspired by origami, and there are these really beautiful, simple, elegant, but kind of geometric designs in that collection. So I have done the the back panel, and I have cast on a tiny little bit of the front panel, which is almost identical up until you get to the, the upper like shoulder neckline shaping. Um, this has been on pause for about a month because of I've been working on a secret project. It's going to be a gift and I'm not going to talk about it until it's actually been gifted. But um, the Orime pattern takes a lot of concentration and a lot of row counting, and the secret project I'm working on is also pretty complicated, and I was using my row counter for it to keep track of a lot of things. So um, I was working on that instead of this, and um, I will return to this probably next week when I am done with the other project. So I'm quite pleased with it. I was nervous when I started it again because of all the problems I had with Gage the first time but I think, I think it is really working out now. But anyway, it is, it is a, a decent enough pattern. I wish that it was a little bit more specific about um, some row counts and gave you a bit more guidance, but it's pretty easy to follow. And this yarn is absolutely beautiful. I've used three different um, yarn lines, I guess, from Brooklyn Tweed, and I've used two of their woolen spun yarns, which are pretty delicate, but I find them easy enough to work with. And then this Piri base is their fingering um, worsted spun. So it doesn't have any nylon on it. It's, it's kind of like a sock yarn, but it's 100% wool. And I really, really love it. Time will tell how it wears. I think it will probably pill because it's, um, it's not super wash, but we'll, we'll see. It feels quite hardy, I guess, quite sturdy, but not uh, scratchy or anything. So there is that. The other garment that I'm working on right now, I think looks really cool. <laughs> I am nervous about the fit though. Um, this is my potato chip knit. It is the stripes pattern by Andrea Mowry. I just really want to knit something with stripes, guys. I've been looking for a pattern and then this came out, I think at the end of last year. And I thought that would be a perfect thing to just stash dive and, and come up with the color combination. And that's what I decided to do. I was working on these other things that just required a lot of concentration and I wanted a lot of mindless stockinette. So I have about one third of a sweater so far. Um, and I really love the colors right now. This this thing right here is a lifeline. That's just scrap yarn in there. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like a circular yoke. It's not a raglan style, it's a circular yoke. And then you split for the sleeves, it's worked top down. And I am almost done with the body. I'm not entirely sure where I'm going to stop. I need to put it on, like try it on again and see exactly where, where it hits at my waist. Because I don't want it to be cropped but I'm afraid that my, my color scheme is 12 rows long because I'm an idiot. And um, if I want to end, like I did the neckline ribbing with the charcoal color and I wanna do that for 
the hem as well, but I think that if I go that far and I get back to the charcoal color, it'll be very long. So I don't know. It'll also have long sleeves. So the yarn for this, the um, kind of black charcoal, like very, very dark gray color in this brown color are the Alpaca Supreme yarn from John Arben Textiles. I bought that for a different project that I decided I didn't want to make anymore. So I just broke into it for this. Um, the lighter gray color is also John Arben Textiles. It's their Cocktails yarn. They sent me a skein of that in an order that went astray. <laughs> the people at John Arben Textiles are amazing. They're the best people ever. They're um, a fiber mill in Devon in England, and their yarn is amazing. Um, and then the red are just scraps of things. This, this color is the same as the crocheted top I showed you before, that Barocco yarn. And then this one, which is a bit more of a brick red color, that is mohair held double from my balloon cardigan. And I didn't have quite enough of it. I got two stripes out of it, but I won't be able to match one of the stripes on the sleeve because I don't have enough of it, but whatever. What matters is that there are pops of red in this color scheme, so I'll be able to make it work. Um, and yeah, this is like my mindless knit. Right now it is pause for a day or two um, until I get up the energy to put it all on waste yarn again so I can try it on. <laughs> So now let me show you the one natural dyeing experiment I've done so far this year. Um, so the concept of natural dyeing, if you don't know anything about this, is simply um, like getting color from the natural world, from plants, from food scraps and stuff. And I'm having so much fun with this. I started doing this at the end of last year, so I haven't done that much, but I'm I'm having fun. And back in January, um, my, my mom does all of this with me. <laughs> She's really interested in it too. So whenever I set up a dye pot, my mom comes over and helps me with all of that. Um, so we were saving up onion skins for a couple of months. We needed a lot of onion skins because they're so light. I think we needed like about 70 grams worth of yellow onion skins and it, it took a while it took a while but we got it so as you can tell <laughs> yellow onion skins basically give you yellows and oranges so let me walk through this stuff um, so this is just plain old onion skins on wool and then this one which might be a little bit darker is just sitting in the dye vat for a little bit longer. They're very similar, but you might actually be able to see the subtle difference a bit more on camera. I have some decent natural light today. You really need natural light to see the depth of these kind of colors and the differences between them. So I'm not the biggest fan of this type of orange, but at least it's a pretty orange. It's a bit more golden and less like neon. I don't like neon colors. So just some some normal yellow onion skins. Um, I didn't do a lot of silk squ swatches for this. This is once again just the plain on the silk noir. It's much yellower on this. Um, you get darker shades on wool, you get lighter shades on silk. And then I tried some modifiers. Modifiers are things that you can add into your dye pot, like into your, your dye, or you can do after baths. So you put everything, your materials into the dye pot and then you take it out and then you immerse it in an after bath of whatever solution you're using. So you can use things like um, washing soda and vinegar to change the pH and that will shift the color sometimes. You can also use metal solutions Iron is the most common one as far as I can tell. It's really, really easy to make iron water. You just put rusty objects or steel wool into a water vinegar solution and let it rust and then you use that. Um, I've also been brewing up a copper modifier, which got to be kind of careful with the metals because copper is toxic. Don't want to mess with that too much, but um, it's a much slower process to get a good um, copper solution. So I really haven't done anything with it yet. I think I might have one here, but it didn't do anything. Copper hasn't reacted with anything that I have tried with yet, but there are some things that I know it does. So I'll be doing those later. So 
Um, the other plain one I have here, this yarn is a wool silk blend and it's the first time I've tried dyeing on this. And as you can tell, compared to the wool, the silk content means it's much lighter. It's definitely a yellow, <laughs> pretty golden yellow. So it's, it's not bad, but uh, once again, I'm not like a huge, huge yellow fan. So there's that. I'm losing things on the floor. And then we have the modified stuff. So this is the copper after bath, which did not have any noticeable effect at all. And then there is the vinegar after bath. So this made the solution more acidic. And once again, there was not really a change there. This one, however, there is. This is the washing soda. I need to stop throwing things on the floor because now I can't reach them. I haven't practiced this, guys. I have no idea what I'm doing. There we go. Okay, you can see the difference between them. The washing soda, um, this is my experience so far. I've done this with two different things, with onion skins and with turmeric. Washing soda, making the solution more base, more basic, um, brings out more of the like reddish, pinkish tones in things that produce yellows and um, orange colors. So it had a noticeable effect here and it gave, it gave more depth to this orange color brought it a little bit more of the red tones in it, I think. Then the really, really big difference is the iron one. So this is the normal and that is the iron and it creates this um, yellowish brown. <laughs> iron is very, very powerful. A little bit of it goes a long way. And in my experiment so far, I think I've been too heavy handed with the iron. This is one of the first times I've done an iron after bath and I thought that they would produce more of a subtle effect, but I think that my, my iron solution was too strong, even though I only put it in the after bath for seven minutes, apparently it came out very, very dark. So yeah, you can do some really beautiful things with iron, but so far I've mostly used it on colors that produce yellowy browns and I, hate yellowy browns. <laughs> and then this last one is um, the dip dyed one. This is the first time that I tried a different dyeing technique and dip dyeing means you get a gradient. Um, one end ends up being in the dye pot for longer than the other end. So you can see that the, the end that was in the pot first gets more orange and then the upper end that was only in there for a couple of minutes is yellow. And I was, I was so happy with the way that this one turned out. I had never tried dip dyeing before, so I had no idea what I was doing or how long to like dip it and everything, but you can actually see that gradient in there. I guess you would call this a, a, a tonal, I suppose. It's definitely a pretty strong tonal. So that was really fun. <laughs> um, and I think I will end by talking about my next projects that I'll be starting. As soon as I finish up any of my works in progress, I will be casting on new things. And let me lean over again. Oof, okay. This is a mess. Um, I am going to be doing another sewing project. Now that I feel confident once again with the sewing machine, I'm going to make myself another pair of pants. I'm gonna go back to the Aronite pants um, pattern and do it again, but better this time. And I'm gonna do it in a red color. In fact, I have a little tiny swatch here. I ordered the fabric for this. Um, it is a medium weight, 100% linen fabric in this really lovely, red color from fabricstore.com. Um, I got some swatches, but their swatches aren't really big enough to tell, like to wash and to figure out the drape and everything. So I just guessed and I bought some. So whenever that comes, I will be diving straight into that sewing project. I'm just going to do it right away. No procrastinating. I just need to get more confidence back with sewing and doing it properly. Also, I really want to use my new fabric shears. I got fabric shears for Christmas and using a proper pair of scissors makes everything easier. <laughs> so that's gonna be my next sewing project. And 
I have an endless queue of knitting projects to get through. Um, but I have three that I will be picking one of them to start next. Um, one of them I have the yarn for, so I'll show this to you quickly. Um, I got some of this really beautiful De Rerum Natura Gilead yarn. I think this is a French yarn company. I say this because the label is entirely in French and I have no idea what it says, except, okay, that definitely says in France. Um, so anyway, this is like a semi woolen spun worsted weight yarn and I have been dying to use it. And I bought this in the color Aster for the Talervo cardigan. I think it's a pattern by Sari Nordland. Um, I saw this in Pom Pom Quarterly and I needed it. I desperately need cardigans and this one looks really lovely. So I have all the yarn to do it and I will probably start this as soon as some of my cables are freed up like all all of my cables from my interchangeable set are used in other projects right now so that's why i can't start any new projects um i'm also planning on making two other sweaters they one of them will be a long-term project <laughs> so i've ordered some yarn from knit picks for these and it's in the mail to me now i'm going to attempt the Handsome Chris Pullover. This is the really famous cabled sweater from Knives Out. It's the white cabled sweater that Chris Evans, uh, his, his character wears in the movie. I recently saw Knives Out and was like, everybody's right about the knitwear in this movie. I wanna try making it. Um, a very kind and intelligent person has reverse engineered this pattern and it is available for free on Ravelry. And I'm just gonna dive in and do it. I, I really want that challenge and I'm doing pretty well at figuring out cabling right now. So this will be a real test. I'm gonna learn a lot by doing that. And then I'm going to be doing a faux cable project. Um, I got the pattern for the Librarian sweater by Skein Dare Knits. I watch her videos regularly on YouTube. She's really awesome. And um, I'm, I'm terrible at stranded color work and most of her stuff involves color work, but she came out with this one and it's like this all over diamond cable look, um, except that it's not actually cabling. And it just has a really interesting construction method. I wanna make it. So this is another one that I've bought yarn for and I will be starting it soon. And yes, I will be knitting sweaters all year round, even during the warmest months of the year because I am that kind of person now. Anyway, um, I need to wrap this up and go get some pain medication for my dog. So that's a bit of a bummer way to end things on, but whatever, that's real life. So. Let me know what your making adventures have been. What are you making? What are you planning on making? Do any of these things look fun? Let me know. I have no proper ending for this. So I'm gonna go away now. Thank you for watching and until next time, bye.